Okay, so the the name of this uh, talk was basically changing faces. I was more uh, about the locations. Uh, for what you guys were talking earlier, I could uh, see that you've been diving definitely more than what I've been diving. I think the last time I got in the water was uh, in March. However, uh, what I wanted to discuss today is using uh, or, or which of the techniques that uh, most of us use normally in certain areas are probably the most uh, practical to use when we move to regions or sites where we're not very used to. And obviously, uh, with all the restrictions that uh, lockdown have imposed on us, uh, most of the dive sites and the areas that usual diving spots have been closed. Uh, have to say, uh, working in travel and, uh, and seeing what the airlines and, and the resorts are saying, things are starting to ease up a little bit. Uh, yes, we, did, we are seeing some flares of, of virus in different areas, but generally speaking, uh, a lot of places are starting to reopen. However, these places that are reopening are slightly less familiar destinations for uh, photographers. Some of them are relatively known for the divers, but they're not very popular in terms of uh, photographers. And um, I'm going to mention some of these, uh, these areas, and then I'm going to talk a little bit about the, the destinations, that, um, the, the techniques sorry, that uh, we can actually transfer from our familiar dive spots to the new ones. Uh, that's basically what I'm going to do. As I said, I'm just going to talk about uh, things that we are used to do or, or techniques and, and styles of photography that we used to work all the time and how they can be practical in areas where we are, we are diving for the first time. Uh, so normally, I don't know you guys, but in my situation and most of the photographers I, I normally talk to, destinations like the Red Sea are probably the most popular ones. Uh, it's, it's easy to get there, one flight, beautiful colors, it's reliable, the reefs are astonishing, we have gorgeous wrecks, the fish life is fantastic, especially if you go like in this time of the year to the northern Red Sea, the, the fish life is absolutely astonishing. We can always or almost always guarantee some sort of interesting encounters like with dolphins and that kind of things that are always in the uh, top of the book list for pretty much every on the world photography. But there's also a lot of more common subjects like box fish and other things that help themselves to, to work as a very interesting models and allow us to take very cool pictures. Other areas that unfortunately are out of uh, limit at the moment is Southeast Asia. Areas like uh, Indonesia, uh, Philippines, that part of the world is famous for beautiful reefs, incredibly healthy uh, uh, corals, beautiful macro, big, big subjects like mantas are not unusual. We can see them in, in areas like Komodo, in Raja, is a great destination if you want to take pictures of these, these big, big creatures. But also some of the most amazing little stuff, like Sean the Sheep, that picture was taken, I think, uh, oops, sorry, uh, taken in the um, in, uh, Philippines a couple of years ago. And they are absolutely astonishing. And because the diving is quite easy, it's a place where you can actually start playing with different techniques. Other areas that are quite popular that at the moment are closed, Maldives, as a photographer, I'm not that keen on the Maldives. Uh, as a diver, I absolutely love it. I think it's a little bit uh, challenging from the photographic point of view because uh, the subjects tend to be a little bit far away, visibility to be quite low, but it's a great place to see big mantis congregations, lots of larger fish, and of course the sharks, which hopefully when you go there, you can get them close if you can actually hold the camera against the the raging currents are normally buried in areas. But as I said, these parts are currently out of range, but there's some other places that we can go at the moment and um, things change constantly. But I would say one of the most reliable areas is the Med. 
and in the Met there's a lot of options. Uh, Malta, very popular with divers, not as much as photographers, but you have great wrecks, you have very good uh, shallow canyons and caves, you have a certain bit of frost that we all love, a little bit of frost is quite, quite photogenic. Uh, we also have uh, very nice swing trues that help themselves to, to very good pictures, like uh, Comino Cave, this this is in Comino Island, which is between Gozo and Malta. And um, I have to say thank you to Dr. Alex Muster for posing so gracefully on this shot. Um, another destination that came up recently to our radar, and I think is becoming very, very, very appealing, is Greece. And in particular, an island, the island of um, Alonisos, which is north of the Greek island, so it's kind of halfway, like center of the country. Uh, beautiful reefs, uh, the whole area is a marine park that opened to diving not long ago, was closed for, for quite a while. So you can see lots of very nice uh, sea fans and gongonias, it's magnificent scenery, nice wrecks, but what really attracts me and, and, and lures me to to Alonisos is the vague, vague chance to get in the water with the monk seals, uh, which live in that area. Uh, they are endangered, but I have to say it's one of the cutest seals I've seen. I've seen quite often the, the gray seals we get here in the UK, but the, the monk seal is one of the cutest seals I've, I've, um, I've seen in pictures, never seen one in the world, and I would love to go and and dive with one of them. Beside the Caribbean, well, there's, a, there's, a, uh, there's another area in the Met that is quite interesting. I don't have any pictures taken by myself or, or by any of the, the people that we work with. It's um, Sardinia. I know Alex um, goes quite often there because uh, Eleonora is, uh, uh, is from Sardinia and the diving there looks very interesting. You have very nice caves. So it's a slightly different environment. Uh, some nice fish, you get seahorses, it's, it's quite interesting. So they are all places that allow us to go at the moment. Otherwise, the Caribbean. Caribbean is always a good uh, destination. It's easy to get there. And all of these destinations, as you can see, there are places that uh, you can reach on a single flight. So we don't have to uh, be bothered with uh, changing uh, airlines or changing planes and stopovers that can increase any risk of contagious. The Caribbean it, it's not as, uh, it doesn't have the wow factor as a uh, place like the Red Sea or Indonesia, but the fish life is incredible and in some areas because there's been quite a lot of diving, the creatures are quite used to divers and it's very easy to get nice shots of, uh, of the, of the rest in marine life, like groupers. The, the sponges are absolutely astonishing and some beautiful, beautiful corals that help themselves to, to very interesting pictures. As I said, the marine life is very friendly and you have nice scenery with the big sea fans, but you also have very interesting macro. You have uh, very, very uh, pretty little fish like the fairy basslets. You have very interesting uh, gobies. And obviously, uh, the other place that we all can go diving, if you fit on the dry suit, which at the moment I don't, uh, is the UK. Uh, I, as, I mean, I'm not very, uh, I, I've not been seen usually in UK dive spots, but um, I've done a fair bit. Uh, mainly, I go to see the seals or sharks. That's what the pictures I have at the moment are uh, those basically, those the two subjects. But it's a, a, a destination that is easy for everyone. Uh, we'll just need to grab the kit, drive down to the coast, and chances are we're going to be able to, to do one or two dives. And um, in my case, and a lot of people that I know, we're not very used to dive in, in uh, UK dive, uh, in UK waters. I know you guys are a bit more used to it, that uh, we are here down in the south. But... Um, it is a different kind of environment and requires different kind of techniques. But you have incredible sites like the blue sharks, as I said, the gray seals, they're always very, very pretty. So with that in mind, 
what are the techniques that I think uh, everyone should consider when you're changing environment? And uh, obviously, because a lot of people used to go abroad and are used to drive in very clear water, and you're going to move to the UK, the main problem you're going to have is a slightly different environment and different conditions. And in this particular case, one of the main problems we're going to find, or most people find, is dealing with backscatter. So the, the first things I'm going to talk about is uh, the, the basics of stroke positioning. Uh, it's incredible how, how often people ask me, or, or, or even experienced photographers, that don't realize how critical is the stroke position to control backscatter. And uh, more important to control backscatter is to control what is called the hotspot on, on the flash. You can see this part of the image, and I just probably moved my mouse so you can actually see, all this area, it doesn't matter how clean the water is on uh, where you're diving, on every single light source that we use on the water, this section here very close to the, the the source itself is always going to create that that uh, snowstorm that, that we call a hot spot. And we always have to avoid using that, that part of the, of the light. Therefore, we're always going to try to use the corners of that uh, light beam. And that is the part that is going to help reducing the problem with backscatter. Unfortunately, if we uh, put an artificial sort of light on the water, we're always going to have some sort of backscatter. And all what we can do is minimize the problem. And to minimize, at least with stroke, we have to use this section of the light beam, not the scent of the light beam. That particular picture I took it in, uh, in Sudan quite a few years back. And uh, I have to say, the guy that was inadvertently posing for this shot had a lot of backscatter because if you can see on this picture his strobes are very very far forward so to avoid the hot spots you have to keep those strobes back on the same dive i took this picture strobe far forward and without changing settings and do anything different but just simply pulling the strobe a little bit further back I took that shot. So you can actually see how the same conditions, which is a very silty wreck, with just varying ever so slightly the position of your of your strokes, makes a big, big difference on the on the result of the, the image. If you consider the position of your strokes, I always recommend people to draw a line basically in front of the of the handles. And with that in mind, if you consider the uh, angle of view of your lens, which if you use a wide angle lens, it's going to be anything between 100 and 160 degrees. If we use a fisheye, it can be up to 180 degrees. Uh, with that in mind, and the, consider the angle of view of the, the lens, the hardest part of the light, the hot spot, will going to be behind the lens, so they're not going to be visible on uh, on the image, and therefore we're going to reduce the amount of backscatter. A couple of years back, I took a picture of uh, our good friend Nick Moore, a terrible picture, but you can actually see how far back he has the the strokes. Now, when you do that, always remember that you will have to increase a little bit the power of the stroke because the further away you have it from the subject. The, the weaker the light uh, is going to be. But it works absolutely fine, even in, in slightly murky conditions, you can basically eliminate all the, or most of the backscatter. I mean, that, that picture is literally out of the camera without any retouching. You can see a little bit of backscatter, but the water itself was quite murky on that day. That is uh, down in uh, Penzance with Charles Hood. But again, it works also in, in blue water. This picture was in, uh, uh, taken in uh, Verde in the Philippines, Verde Island. And that particular site had a lot of plankton, therefore there's a lot of particles in the water. But by moving this drop further back, 
you can reduce all that uh, that crap. So keep that in mind whenever you go to a new destination and you realize that the water is not clean, always pull those strokes as far back as you can to avoid problems. Some people, or, or, or all the books used to say to point the strokes slightly outwards. Uh, I don't find that helps as much and you have greater risk of create a darker band in the center of the frame because the light beams will not cross as easy. I do prefer when the, um, when the strobes are further back going forward in a way that the hotspot is behind the angle of view of the lens, but the light beam just crosses in front of the, of the dome board and lights the whole scene. Another technique that I absolutely love and I use quite a lot, and um, I learned this technique for working or doing workshops with uh, Martin Edge, is inward lighting. And uh, whenever there's a lot of uh, sediment or we have to dive in an area that is not as uh, lush in terms of uh, density of corals as areas like the Red Sea or, or, or Indonesia, and you have a subject that you want to isolate, inward lighting is, is an excellent technique. And basically what you do is you point the strokes inward to yourself and you have certain level of degree of how far uh, back you're going to point those strokes. But what you want to do is, as you have your angle of view, is to point the strokes towards the, ca the, the handles or towards your face and only use just a corner of the light beam. That way the hotspot is in the back and you're going to only going to be using this section here of the light beam. That means that this part here won't have any light whatsoever. We're doing a workshop in uh, Indonesia, Kalimantan, a couple of years back, and you can see this one of the, the participants practicing inward lighting on, on a piece of a sponge, and you can see how the strobes are pointing basically to the hands. And if you draw a line from each one of the strobes, it's only lighting this section here of the of the sponge. I didn't photograph this particular sponge, but I photographed one virtually a couple of uh, meters away. And that is the kind of results you can get with inward lighting. So you can only light what is very close to the port and nothing behind, creating quite a nice separation, which is quite handy in cases like this. It's nothing particularly exciting. It's a little sponge on a kind of boring and distracting background. With the strokes forward, you are lighting that background and is taking away everything from a subject that per se is not that interesting. With, with a little bit of inward lighting, the same subject certainly is going to look much more interesting because the light will, is going to light only that sponge. And by using a, a quite a fast shot speed and a, a small aperture, I was able to darken pretty much the whole of the reef. So I'm not, have, I'm not happy with that distraction of the color and the texture. It's just a very, very uh, strong shadow, almost black in the background. The sun and the subject lit by, by the, the sunbeam. And it's not just for your wide angle. Inward lighting works uh, very well also for macro. That is a cuttlefish in uh, the Philippines. And uh, by using inward lighting, I was able to pretty much black or darken all the background, even when the subject is relatively close to the reef. That's a candy crab, similar, similar kind of uh, principle. The, the, the strobes are lighting only this, a little bit of the sea fan and the candy crab, and the nudibranch as well. That nudibranch was on, on quite of a messy reef, but by pointing the strips to me, I was able to put the light only on the fish and on the, on the sorry, on the nudibranch and on the little um, piece of coral and create that black background that even if you use a fast shot to speed, you will not be able to completely eliminate if you have your strips pointing forward. 
Another very good technique uh, that uh, I use when I'm looking to a new area that uh, can create quite a lot of challenges in terms of dealing with the ambient light uh, or the um, or the back scatter and the particles in the water is snooting. And snooting, a lot of people try to do it, but I found that it's not very clear how it works, uh, how a snoot works. The snoot effectively is no more than a funnel that channels the light. Instead of opening it as we do with the diffusers, the snoot just pointed into one area. And it was made popular about 10 years ago by Kerry Will, who started doing quite a lot of uh, snooting and won quite a lot of uh, uh, awards that way. But a snoot, ha you have to consider different things. One is the aperture of the hole of the, the snoot itself. The smaller the aperture, the narrower the, the beam of light is going to be. And uh, you can imagine those uh, fiber optic uh, that are uh, use kind of a tentacle, those tend to be very, very narrow. A larger aperture will have a very wide uh, beam. In a very similar way, uh, uh, the length of the snoot itself is going to change the width of the beam. Exactly the same as with the focal length of, uh, of, of the lenses we use. The shorter the lens, the wider it is. With a snoot, the shorter the snoot, the wider the light beam it is. Uh, just imagine this is almost like a wide angle lens, and this is like a macro or a tele. Shorter distance means a wider light beam, and a longer distance means a narrower light beam. And if we have everything the same, and we only consider the width of the snoot itself, not the aperture, but the width of the snoot itself, that also have the same effect. So the wider the snoot, the wider the beam, the narrower the snoot, the, the narrower the beam. The beauty of the snoot is that will help a lot to reduce the backscatter because we're not lighting the, the, the water or the particles around us. So you're not creating all that, that snowstorm that then takes ages to remove in, uh, in Photoshop. It has to be very well aimed, especially when you're shooting macro. I mean, that's um, a little shrimp in the, in the Philippines, a little shrimp, and it's tiny. That's about half a centimeter, I would say. If you don't aim it very well, it's going to be very difficult to, to have a, any, any decent result. To a point that it's quite often good to work with your dive body when you're using a snoot, so your dive body can point the snoot to the subject while you can move around and take the picture. That if you have someone helping you that knows what you're doing. When it works, it works absolutely fine. This is a mimic octopus in black sand. And as you can see, normally black sand absorbs everything, but by using a snoot, I just concentrate the light on the actual octopus. Therefore, the, the sun is not distracting, it just focusing the attention where you want it. Normally, I set up this node, and if you have a snoot that have a targeting light, or you can use the modeling light of the strobe, it's absolutely ideal. You set this node up, and you first focus where the light of the, that um, focusing light of the, the beam from this node which is, and you lock the focusing there. So I always get everything, lock the focusing, and using back focusing, or manually just turn the auto focus off. I set everything, and then move towards my subject, just moving the camera and the whole rig back and forth until I see the subject in focus in the viewfinder. And at that point, you can take the picture. It can be quite tricky. And the easiest way to start with is mounting the snoot right above the lens pointing slightly forward, so it's easy and you know exactly where it goes. But you can have very, very interesting uh, results. And it's a very good way to isolate completely the subject. In that shot is against the reef with a uh, with snoot during the day. This is not a night dive. Because it's against the reef, if I don't use a snoot, 
you could potentially use inward lighting, but otherwise you will show all the, 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 the reef itself, the, the other parts of the, um, the soft coral. It's quite tempting to start trying to fiddle with the power, but that means that you're gonna lose your aim. So what I normally do, I set the stroke about three quarters of power, and then with the dial that changes the ISO, I go up or down just to change the exposure by using the ISO. Obviously that is much better if your camera is quite good handling ISO, but the amount of changes if you've done a couple of test shots beforehand, are uh, very very little and you shouldn't have any problems uh, dealing with uh, excessive noise if you start doing this as a technique uh, when we're changing destinations noting i found it very very practical when you start uh, working with subjects that are on the ground like bottom dwellers stargazers stargazers work very well with snoot because you, as I said before, you can concentrate the beam in exactly where you want it. Seamoth or Pegasus, very, very interesting. Flamboyant cuttlefish. All of these can be quite nicely taken with, with Snoot without the risk of, uh, of creating backscatter or illuminating part of the subject that you don't want to, to illuminate. But Snood works quite well with wide angle. And uh, if you go to areas like the Caribbean or, or the Met, it can be quite handy in, in, in those situations when, when you suddenly find an area that, as the image I showed earlier with the um, little uh, sponge and the nasty background, that was an anemone on a slightly rubbly slope. And I just had a wider Snood that I made with um, an old uh, wetsuit, a sleeve from a wetsuit, just put it into the front of the strobe, and I was able to light the whole anemone without lighting the background. But you can actually do it in mid water. That is um, a, a nice uh, feral cuttlefish. It was mid water early uh, about midday this particular picture was taken and uh, the only way to separate the subject from the background was to channel in the light right on the subject so it's a, it's a nice way to deal with that kind of situations when you have a lot of uh, empty space a very interesting subject and you want to completely separate the subject from the from the background and pretty much eliminating the background or, or taking all the relevance away from the background. Uh, the next technique that I absolutely love in a case to deal with either backscatter or with subjects when you want to get more interest on the subject itself is close focus wide angle. And close focus wide angle works very, very well with so that allow you to approach quite quite well and again we're talking about the caribbean a bit earlier and that's one of the nicest places to take this kind of shot because the groupers there are very very friendly sardinia has some also very friendly groupers and because they live in a protected area they're not afraid of divers so you can get close fairly fairly easy then this uh, goliath grouper that was the size of our dinner table and it was just following the divers on this dive side so what do you do? You have to bring those strokes as close as possible, but always maintaining a certain distance from the angle of coverage. So you have to practice quite a lot when you do this to avoid the hot spot. It's very easy to get this part here with hot spots and a lot of backscatter. So bring that. Uh, I do remember seeing um, uh, different people using very uh, strong diffusers on the strokes and I found that when you know you're going to be doing close focus wide angle lens shots uh, smaller strokes like the little Enon S2000s work very very well because you can get them very close to the port and by getting them close to the port you can 
ensure that the light beam is going to cross very, very close to the edge of the sphere of your dome board. If you start moving those strobes a bit further apart, this point where the light crosses is going to move further out and you end up with this subject that close, quite, uh, quite dark. But it is a technique that works very well to eliminate a lot of the crap that is, is around quite often. That is, um, that more was in shock on your land, if I'm not wrong, a few, a few years back. And the, the nostrils were pretty much on my dome pool. Same with this little turtle. So they get very, very close to to uh, the sub uh, to the dome pool, and that's when you have to start bringing those strokes as close as possible to the housing. Otherwise, it's going to be quite dark. But it works pretty much in all all the situations, and you can actually see how, even in slightly murky conditions. I was able to pretty much eliminate all the back scatter. You can still see a little bit around there, but you can actually use it quite, quite, quite well. And if you practice a little bit, you can actually start using close focus wide angle lens with a little bit of inward lighting. It can be a little bit tricky, but you can end up with very interesting shots like that Moray taken in, um, on Big Brother. A couple of, uh, of years back. If we're moving from one familiar area to a different area where the conditions are quite different, it's quite important to consider the how you're going to light, how you're going to use the uh, background lighting and controlling the exposure of the of the background. And um, normally I mean, I assume this is quite familiar to everyone, but it's always good idea to remind people that the shutter speed controls the light on the background. The aperture controls everything. So if you want to change the color of your background, you change your shutter speed and the exposure of your flashes should not be affected. For example, that is a picture taken in uh, Kalimantan of a table coral at about a hundredth of a second. Exactly the same picture, but at 250, and this is the result. So you can actually see by closing that uh, shutter speed quite a lot, I was able to reduce a lot of, uh, of backscat and a lot of uh, crap from the, the image. When you go to the previous one, you can see there's quite a lot of stuff in the water there and there. But by increasing the shutter speed, I was able to darken the background quite a lot and therefore darken the amount of light that hits those particles. Those are not lit by the strobes, they were lit by the sun because it's slightly uh, double light. So that those were reflections on the on the dome put from the sun. In UK, quite often you have to do the opposite because you will need a bit more light. So either you reduce a lot the shutter speed and then you may have problems with uh, camera shake. Otherwise, the only other option we have is to start playing with the ISO. And to compensate for the low light, we have to increase the ISO by quite a lot. But with modern cameras, that is not a problem. And honestly, I do prefer an image that is slightly grainy, but it shows a nice, beautiful, green background than something that is very smooth but is too dark because I did not have enough shutter speed to give the ambient light a go. But it works quite well. That was a little bit slow. I remember this particular shot was, I think it was the 30th of a second in Lundy a couple of years back. But uh, it, it, it can work and you can actually see that changing the shutter speed and remembering to start playing with the ambient light before you start taking the picture is quite a good thing. So if you're used to UK and you move to areas like the Med, you will find out that you will have to use a much faster shutter speed and you're going to be able to drop the, the ISO quite, quite a lot. On the other hand, if you're used to 
diving in clear water like myself, you're a wuss and you don't like getting there in cold water, but the age for diving is, is too much and you want to give it a go, you have to remember that the ambient light is lower and you will have to slow the shutter speed quite a lot and probably also have to increase the ISO a fair bit in order to have a good exposure. There are many other techniques that are, that are quite, quite handy to, to use. Uh, can spend here ages, but this is a small selection of the ones I do consider useful to keep in mind and always review when we're moving from one destination to another, from one kind of subject to another, because there are techniques that are uh, like mainly lighting techniques, as you, you could say, that allows to deal with problems that the conditions create, like backscatter, like uh, the color of the, the water. So these are a small, smaller section of uh, techniques that are quite handy to, to keep. And always, I mean, the next time you go driving, take time to play around, practice and experiment for to getting the best result. Don't jump in and start taking what you expect to be the award-winning image. It's just a question of time, practice, get in and find a pebble, find a piece of uh, seaweed, a piece of broken color, even your dry body, and play around, change the stroke position, change your settings in order to get that confident that and that level of exposure and, and lighting you want for those particular conditions. Because now we're having to get in the water in place that we're not familiar and it is the best approach that uh, you can have. That's, that's it for now for me. So if you guys have any questions,